This week, we're sharing a recent conversation that I had with Thomas Meyer Falk, an anarchist who just finished a 27 year stint in prison in Germany, speaking about his life, his incarceration, and his hopes now that he's out. Thomas was involved in a bank robbery in 1996 as a young, rash anarchist skinhead who hoped to fund above ground and underground leftist organizing and continued to be incarcerated for the threats that he made upon his capture. While inside, he toned it down a bit became a jailhouse lawyer of sorts, and built connections with publishing projects, support groups, and a radio station on the outside. He's out now and working at that radio station in Freiburg, RDL. And he hopes to become involved in helping immigrants navigate the legal system in Germany. You can find his blog, mostly in German, but bits in English, at freedomforthomas.wordpress.com, which I've linked in the show notes to point you to the English language portions. A quick reminder that there's a fundraising effort going on to help former Black Liberation fighter and political prisoner Zolo Azania, who we featured a couple times on the show, and we'll link those in the show notes. Since his release in 2017, after 35 years in prison, he's been an active community organizer on projects including reentry for formerly incarcerated folks and offering pro bono legal help to folks still behind bars. He is in need of some support with car repair payments to help him keep his wage job and keeping him able to participate in this sort of support work that he's been involved in. You can donate to him on Cash App via the handle dollar sign Z-O-L-O-A-Z-A-N-I-A, the number five, Zolo Azania five, or on Zelle using AzaniaZolo5 at gmail.com, or on Venmo using the handle at Zolo hyphen Azania. To find out more anti-repression fundraisers needing support and boosting, you can check out the column on itsgoingdown.org called In Contempt, where you can also find info on prisoners who have just been moved or who have upcoming birthdays or might just be in need of support and help. My name is Thomas Oliver Meyerfolk. I'm from Germany. Actually, I live in Freiburg. It's a town in the southwest of Germany. I was born in 1971. And I was, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a so-called male, it's my gender, and uh, I was in, I'm 52 years old, I was born as a child of a teacher and a nurse, I have two siblings. Uh, I'm really interested in politics since uh, I was really a young child, Um, I began with a law book. It was really fascinating because when I was 11 years old, a uh, teacher gave me a collection of German law uh, as a gift. I don't know why, because I don't I don't remember. And so the following years, I read a lot about the law. And in the beginning, I was young, I was a child, and I thought about the theory of law. And I thought it sounds really kind of justice. But uh, when I became 40, 50, or 16 years old, I saw that the theory on the one hand and the reality on the other hand are really spread around far away, like America and Europe, there's a big ocean between. And so this was one point because uh, why I became interested in politics. I was fascinating about social democrats who are called in America socialists, but uh, social democrats nothing in Germany have nothing to do with uh, socialists. And from the social democrats, I went to anarchism because I think there's no one who should be our boss or whatever. There's no God, there's no king or no authority. And I was really confused because a lot of people said anarchy means that you can kill, rape or do whatever you want. And I think that's not a political view of anarchism and it has nothing to do with anarchism as a political point, way of life, of thinking. So, Yeah, that's really fascinating. When you mentioned that you saw when you were a teenager discrepancies between law in theory and law in practice, are there any examples of moments that you experienced that really brought that to light? Was it experiencing your own interactions with law enforcement or seeing other people? Yes, I was interested in law enforcement and I visited as a guest uh, the, the, the trials in our in a little town. It was a so-called Amtsgericht. It's the local court in the United States, I think. And I, n- never, never I met any person who 
was there with a lawyer or who seems that he or she has any money. They are poor people. They came to court, they were convicted. And in, in the beginning, it wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't have a theory. It was only, a, it was a kind of feeling that uh, it seems so injustice, injustice is the right word, I think, uh, injustice that uh, yeah, poor people get punished. And I read a lot of uh, newspapers also when I was a young, a young child. And, and there I read that if you have enough money, you can buy the best lawyers uh, and then you have better chances in the beginning not to get prosecuted and later if you get prosecuted not to get convicted and if you get convicted and you are a rich person you have also better chances not to get uh, not to get it came in prison so the connection between your financial background and your position in the society main point if you went to court if you get released uh, yeah yeah I, I know what you mean I guess moving forward a few years, it, if I understand, you became involved in the skinhead movement, yeah, which is very much focused on working class identity, and and were involved in as a rash or red red mm -hmm. anarchist skinhead. Um, yeah, I wonder if I could kind of see a trajectory there between seeing an injustice of the system around you and also couching a lot of how that injustice operates based on the class background of the individuals and their access to wealth, and so. Can you talk a little bit about what you got out of Rash, how you got into that, um, what it was like at the time? Because there's still Rash crews around, too, which is, I think, it's interesting. I grew up in a little little village, and first I met some kind of punks. And I think maybe if you will see it from a psychological kind of view, it was a kind of protestation when I cut off all my hairs. And I, it was in the 80s and in the 90s, and I met people who were also interested in left-wing politics because uh, I don't know the situation, uh, li I only read uh, something about the uh, United States, but you have these, uh, you have mostly people think if you are a, a skinhead and don't wear hats, you must be a right-wing skinhead. And that's not true, the, the roots from uh, the skinheads I what I read is in the uh, United Kingdom in Great Britain, and it came, like you said, from the working class and from a left-wing point of view, and not from the right-wing. It were the right-wing who occupied these uh, symbols and these uh, yeah, kind of way of life. I never was interested in drinking as much as possible. I'm, I was more interested in, in politics, in in theories and to bring theories into practice. We were only a little group and yes, and yeah, I was 20, 21, 22. And then uh, some years later I went to prison. And for me, it helps me a lot to have a political homeland. Did you grow up in East Germany or West Germany? No, I was, uh, I'm here from Freiburg from the Southwest of Germany. I guess seeing what in the West sometimes we call as real existing socialism, just mm -hmm. the other part of the country and getting to speak with people that lived with that, as well as experiencing yourself living under capitalism, even though there were leftist statist parties. Did that also shape your understanding of left wing politics and re a, re a rejection of bosses? I think so. I think uh, we can't Yes, it's, uh, the, the so-called um, GDR, German Democratic Rep Republic, the east of Germany or Soviet Union. I, it was, I, kind of, I think, uh, a kind of dictatorship and it's nothing to do with some really quite interesting and important ideas which uh, Karl Marx uh, say, had. Also, like I said before, it, in the beginning it was a feeling. Like I said, I read a lot of new papers also when I was a young boy or a young child. And I read also papers from the GDR public uh, papers, which idolized the situation in the uh, Eastern world. Uh, it was presented as a, a kind of heaven on earth, but it wasn't a heaven on earth. It was also yeah, a brutal dictatorship very often. And yeah, in the, in the, the fundamental point is, I think in the beginning is a feeling, a feeling in my, in my heart, in my stomach that we can exist without bosses, without a party. And 
the dictatorship of the money in the Western world was replaced in uh, Eastern Germany or in the Soviet Union by a dictatorship of the party and a dictatorship of the leaders of the party. And I think these this has has nothing to do with the association of free humans. So there wasn't any wish to 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 leave the the country from the west to the to the east because uh, you would came from one dictatorship to another one. Yeah. So people who know your name who are listening to this um, may be familiar with you as a very long long standing anarchist prisoner held in Germany for twenty seven years, having just been released in at the end of August of this year and who has contributed to a number of journals, including in English, such as Fire Ant. And you were one of the prisoners that was supported by the June 11th Day of Solidarity with Marius Mason and all long-term anarchist prisoners. I feel really blessed to be able to have this conversation with you. So my understanding is you were convicted initially of bank robbery that was going to support political spaces where you were at or in Germany. There's other long-term anarchist prisoners, um, such as Oso Blanco, who also were doing bank robberies to fund leftist or liberatory infrastructure, and he's still inside. But I wonder if you could talk a, a little bit about the political scene, what the political scene was like around that time, around the mid-1990s that you were involved in, and what sort of projects it, it were that um, you were looking to support. I think it's a little bit difficult to talk about this uh, situation in the, nine, in the middle of the 90s because I plan to uh, support uh, left-wing legal and illegal projects and that was the idea and it uh, ends in a, uh, in a bank robber which doesn't uh, work well. I was kept in this bank after 14 hours and so I think <laughs> it was... Yes, uh, the idea was to support left-wing projects on the one hand and uh, illegal projects on the other hand, the left-wing on the the left-wing projects on the legal side of the law means all left-wing projects in the middle of the 90s like now in the 21st century has problems to raise money for their really important projects to uh, support foreigners, to support to support prisoners, to to support poor people and the idea was to yeah, to organize money for these and also for illegal projects, because I thought in the middle of the 90s that if we want to live in a better world, we have to, to change the system, but not in a way like uh, the people in the GDR changed their system. They was really peaceful because I think the GDR system was rotten. And in the 90 89, I thought there was uh, a moment in which the uh, Soviet Union um, discussed if they should smash these peaceful protests in not only in the GDR, or also in other Eastern Europe states. But finally, because of the rotten system, the system in the GDR and a lot of other Eastern countries changed peacefully or mostly peacefully. But I was I'm, I was sure, and I'm sure today also, that uh, the capitalism would never accept a peaceful transformation into a, a society in which uh, money or capital will be uh, overruled. I thought that the political leaders in Germany or wherever in the Western world will defend their position and defend their society with violence, with uh, using police, with uh, using military. That's what I want to point out. In the GDR, the leaders said they don't defend their system with the military. If they would do so, I think it would be really hurtful and uh, for, for, for a lot of people. I think it was also important to uh, support illegal projects. Yeah, definitely. It makes sense that the while the GDR was willing to allow for reunification, allow for the wall to come down. I mean, they were running razor wire at the wall for a long time, attempting to shoot people who would leave East Germany, right? Like they did defend their power with weapons on a regular basis. But to assume to assume that legal method using the systems tools inside of either side of Germany that the state wouldn't hold itself to the same methods of peaceful use of courts and such 
makes a lot of sense to me. I can understand being of that perspective. Yeah, so you were arrested after 14 hours inside of the bank. Did you receive much support from movement at the time of the robbery? And if so, what groups publicly supported you or or what sort of like strata of the political movement um, supported you? In the beginning, it was a little bit difficult because I decided uh, that I won't be the typical defendant because I said my deepest opinion about the state and about the system and about the law, about the judges. I used really bad words. I insulted uh, every prosecutor, every every judge. I don't said I don't sit at the bench for for the defendant and said, oh, I have a, I was a poor child. My I have any problems in my childhood. I said, fuck you. And when I come out, I will kill you. I will kill the judges. I will kill the prosecutor. I was full of hate, and I spread this. Uh, hate around and this make it difficult for people outside uh, to support these uh, def- uh, defendant there. Uh, after one one year, one and a half years, I get better connections to people outside, especially from Austria or from United Kingdom. And I don't think, I don't know if they only accept my point of view or I, I don't know, but uh, I was really happy that I got this support from these people outside. It was in the beginning of the internet. The internet in the middle of the 90s wasn't uh, really important such uh, like today. Yes, but I think, uh, yeah, the first uh, 10 years, yeah, the first 10 years, uh, the first 11 years after my arrest, uh, uh, I was uh, kept in solitary confinement because of these, uh, yeah, these words I spread around. It was not, it had nothing to do with diplomacy or with uh, tactic. I thought it's important that one person, it was me, have to, yeah, to spread around the hate which I felt and which I think or which I thought that a lot of people outside felt too. But maybe you understand that it's difficult for people outside that if there is a prisoner who spread around his deepest feelings and his, his hate on this way makes it difficult for people outside to support him or she or her. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, where I was arrested. I, I was convicted for these uh, um, questions too. Yep. Also. Were the communications shared with the people outside of the court? Like, did the state say... Well, look, we have to. This this person is being really angry and threatening. This is definitely a, a threat. Did they allow that into the media at all, or was it all just the internal court systems digesting this and deciding where you would go? Uh, I think the panel code from United States and uh, Germany uh, in this point is really uh, different. We have not such internal courts in the prisons like you have in the United States. The in Germany, the prosecutor convicted you and you have to go to a regular local court or a local high court and for for the bank robbery and uh i took when i took hostages in this bank for these 13 hours i got 11 and a half years and later the courts added it uh, five years and three months for insulting and threatening judges prosecutors and whatever one 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 more point you asked about the communication with people outside uh, because I was kept in a solitary confinement, the uh, warden or the deputy warden read all my incoming and outgoing mail. And uh, some, sometimes I got letters from uh, comrades outside. It was really funny because they maybe they had written, uh, fuck all cops, uh, or a, a good, only, a good, uh, only a dead cop is a good cop. Uh, they don't gave me this letter. They informed me that somebody has written to Mr. Meyerfeld, to me, that only a dead cop is a good cop, and for this reason you don't get the letter. So they informed me why I shouldn't get this letter, and uh, they make a citation of uh, for the phrase. Uh, it's really it was uh, stupid. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, this uh, this was the way. This was the way how they uh, controlled the uh, situation. Yeah. The the here's here's the thing that we don't want you to hear. 
So we're going to just mm-hmm. tell you that and nothing else yeah, exactly. letter about how your dog is doing or like mm-hmm. what the weather's like. Really intelligent. And so 11 and a half years for the robbery with the hostages and five for the threats. And then how did it become 27? Was that because of conflicts inside of the prison system? No, I was uh, convicted for the bank robbery for 11 and a half years and they added the so-called preventive detention because... I was such angry uh, in the first uh, year uh, when I was kept in the bank. Uh, preventive detention uh, is a law from uh, the Nazis. It became to law in 1933, and it allows it allows uh, it allows the state to keep someone in prison after finishing the regular sentence. I think it's a little bit com- you can compare it a little bit with uh, the U.S. law: three strikes and you are out. In Germany, it uh, you don't need three strikes. Uh, the preventive detention is such is is is, uh, is, uh, is comparable with these three strikes and you're out. And it's li- really different. Uh, the, the the living conditions between uh, a regular correction center and the preventive detention center both are prisons. But uh, the preventive detention center, you have bigger cells, you have bigger television, you can wear your own clothes. So uh, until 2013. I was kept in the regular sentence and beginning in July 2013, the preventive detention period has begun. And so I was transferred from Bruchsal, it's uh, the prison in the north of Baden-Württemberg. Baden-Württemberg is one of the 16 states of Germany where I lived and I'm still living. And I was transferred here to Freiburg in the southwest of uh, Baden-Württemberg or in the southwest of Germany. Because here in Freiburg, we have this uh, preventive detention unit uh, in our local prison. And so I lived here for the next 10 years from 2013 until 2023. It was really helpful for me that I was interested in law when I was, when I was really a young child because it helps me a lot to fight inside the prison for other prisoners and also for myself. And it, it helped me a lot to finally to came out of the prison because when I was uh, convicted in 1997, one year after the bank robbery, I was convicted. The law said if somebody gets convicted to these preventive detention, he or she must be released after 10 years. Nothing interesting what happened between after 10 years to have to be, this person has to be released. And in 1998, the German parliament changed this law and said if somebody is released after nine years of the preventive detention why should we release this person after 10 years if he or she is dangerous after nine or nine and a half years uh, there and there isn't be a miracle why he or she shouldn't be dangerous after 10 years and so they cut this 10-year border this 10-year border i think grenze border limit and mm-hmm, and uh make it into a infinite preventive detention period. And so it was quite interesting what they want to do with people who were convicted before these new paragraph became law, because regularly the constitutions in Germany or also in the United States forbid the state to change a law for cases which are closed. It's not possible to uh, widen a sentence after the court has find its decision and so the german constitutional court accepted the german law the reform of the law but in 2009 the european court of human uh, human rights it's a little bit it's, it's like in i think in in, in the states or in, in north and south america you have the american international court the inter-american court of human rights inter-american court yes and we have something like this uh, in uh, europe too the european court of uh, human rights and uh, in 2009 the court declared that the german law violates the const- the european convention of human rights because it's strictly prohibited to change law for for cases which are closed 2011, two years later, the German Constitutional Court said it's right, uh, it's forbidden to widen a sentence for 
pre for people which are convicted in the past, but the preventive detention in the view of the German federal court isn't a sentence. The preventive detention, that's the point of view of the German constitutional court, tries to protect people outside from criminal action in the future. So it isn't, it hasn't nothing to do with repression for criminal actions with has happened in the past. So it's really a, a yeah, it's a point of view for uh, uh, from, from judges or yeah, high educated people because for the detainees in the prevention, pre preventive detention unit, it doesn't matter if you stay there for things you have done in the past or which you may be, it's only a kind of uh, speculation which you may do in the future. And so finally, a uh, German constitutional court declared in 2011 for people who were uh, convicted before these uh, reform in 1998, they can kept in the preventive detention unit longer than 10 years only if they have a psychological disease. And based on this psychological disease, for reasons into their attitude or into their behavior or what they have done in the prison, they are the high risk that these detainees would be done any high criminal actions in the future. And the, the, the important point is high risk. It doesn't, uh, if only there is a low risk or a middle risk, a kind of middle risk, then you have to be released. And in my case, uh, three psychiatrists said in 2022 and 2023 that there are no reasons to uh, come to the conclusion that I will do any uh, I will do uh, any crime again. So it, I don't know, I don't know if it makes sense for you. Yeah, no that that makes sense. Like it's clear to me that the preventative detention is not a sentence or, for a conviction of a crime. It's the purview of the state's professionals to determine whether or not someone is going to commit something in the future is a really scary, it's a really scary idea, but it's like an unspoken foundation of a lot of how law enforcement and criminalization operates. We had until I think the late 1990s, early 2000s, parole was a really frequent method of denying people release after the end of their sentence inside of the United States. And the parole boards would decide they would be made of former judges, former law enforcement, former prison guards or wardens, sometimes prosecutors. They could deny parole to someone based on their personal opinions, based on anything, you know. But when they when they changed the laws to to make mandatory maximums for convictions where someone does a crime for 10 years, they are released after 10 years, unless they've done a bunch of other stuff inside the prison that would be considered to be what you would say high crimes. Um, they could be held in perpetuity, which is, for instance, what my friend Sean in the US prisons experiences. He keeps getting denied by parole, although he hasn't had any of those high crime instances. It's just the prison system doesn't want to let go of them. In any case, it's a it's a frightening precedent when you're talking about putting someone in a cage. Mm. I think uh, you can compare it with um, Minority Report. I think a lot of people know this movie or the, the story. So you were kind enough to share with me parts of the pub some of your published works that were combined into a, a translated form, but of uh, of your poems and of your essays entitled News from Behind the Bars. And some of the descriptions of circumstances, like what we've been talking about just now, of what you experienced on the inside uh, are frighteningly similar to stories that I've heard from people inside the United States prisons. And that and like the, the idea of holding someone in solitary confinement for 10 years, is, I think solitary confinement is generally considered to be a human rights violation in a lot of parts of the world. And I was under the impression like long-term solitary was also considered such in Europe. But well, in, in these essays, you mentioned that your background in law allowed you to also operate within the court systems and defend yourselves legally and also defend other prisoners. Uh, like you did some of the court writings and um, 
I guess, retorts for some prisoners that you were incarcerated with. How was that? Were there resources available to people that were incarcerated to be able to legally defend themselves in the court systems? Or were you like, did you have libraries, legal libraries that you could access? How did that work? No, uh, uh, every prison has a library, but uh, there aren't a lot of law books. So for this reason, some uh, friends and comrades outside bought me the two or three really important law books, commentaries to the panel law. And when I heard about an important decision from a high court or a local high court, I wrote to the court to and asked for a copy of these decision. And so this it was enough for me to uh, to write lawsuits for other prisoners and for me. The common law and the European law are really different. You have, I, th I think in the United States you have also a law book, but uh, the case law is much more important than in, in Germany. In Germany, uh, only the law book, uh, the, what the written law is important. So everyone who can read, uh, and I have to you have to guess a lot of people in prisons can't read yeah uh, a lot of analphabetism so you have to if, but if you have the possibility to read or somebody uh, tells you what's uh, written in the law book you can defend yourself and it's not really expensive uh, you haven't to you haven't uh, to pay uh, any euro or any dollar before you uh, fill a lawsuit i have heard from united states that uh, courts there often want to get money before they prove a case and it's not uh, like the german uh, system works if you lose a case they send you a bill but only it says 30 dollars round about or 40 dollars it's uh, yeah it's uh, for every prisoner uh, 30 or 40 dollars are uh, a high sum but uh, you haven't to pay it before the, the, the judge prove your case you have to pay it after he has proved the case and so yes uh, for me it was really helpful to uh, w that i was interested in law in uh, when i was really young because i think that's helped me a lot to understand how the warden and his uh, the stuff is thinking because all people who studied law have a specific point of view of the world and of a situation and in German you said, or in Deutsch you said, uh, subsumieren, subsumption. If you, you have a you have a case, you have you have a question or whatever, and you some make a subsumption, subsumieren. You understand? You know the word subsumieren, subsumption, subsumption, situation in the life under a law. You have to find a you have to find a paragraph, and. There are not not a lot of paragraphs in the in the, in the panel law which uh, is, uh, protect inmates, but there are some, and you have to find them out, and then you can uh, go to court. And often we won, and often we lost the cases. Uh, yes. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Welcome to Molotov Now, a podcast about taking action. In Molotov Now, we analyze and discuss news articles and stories of resistance from around the globe and connect them to our struggles here at home in Aberdeen, Washington. In the spirit of building solidarity between the rural and the urban, we hope to inspire direct action in the face of oppression and to light a fire to find each other in the darkness. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. I had wondered if there, if you could talk a little bit of about if there was much of an opportunity while you were inside of the prison to organize uh, around political education, 
prisoner unions, legal defense, or other types of means uh, for like self-defense among the prisoners, or if that culture exists or or was actually needed. Like, do any moments of connection like this stick out to you, either initiated by other people that were in prison or by yourself? The first 10 years I was kept in isolation, and I haven't the possibility to meet other prisoners by person, but I was in touch with uh, some prisoners in Germany and in Great Britain and also in the United States by sharing letters. And I thought it was much easier to get an international cooperation between prisoners than establish a kind of organization directly in the prison where I stayed. When I came into the population in 2007, when the uh, solitary confinement ends, I tried to help prisoners by doing their legal works to bring lawsuits to court or fight against uh, the decision that they should be extra dieted, uh, the, that they have to, they, uh, for, foreigner prisoners often have to leave the country and I help them to uh, file uh, lawsuits against these decisions. But I thought it was really difficult to establish a kind of organization. But in the end of the, in the middle and in the end of the 2000, 2000s, 2005, 2008, I don't know the exact date, there was organization called Prisoners Union. They were established in Berlin. There were uh, some left-wing political inmates there which started these uh, Prisoners Union and they were struggling for the prisoners' rights. And the first topic was to get more money for the slavery work. In Germany, we can earn around b between $200 or $300 each month. We follow the directions of the state and uh, yeah, and do this uh, prisoner's slavery work. But we have a really interesting jurisdiction in Germany because the federal constitutional court declared in 1998 that if the state force inmates to work, they must show the inmates the worth of labor. And so this means that it is prohibited by constitutional rights that the inmates only get uh, yeah, some, some, some euro or some dollars. This was the beginning in uh, Berlin uh, to establish these prisoners union. And as I know now, we have uh, chapters in all 16 states. As I told you last time, Germany exists of uh, 16 states from Bavaria, maybe some people know Bavarian beer, or German Volksmusik, umtata, umtata. So we have 16 states, and in all 16 states, there were some prisoners' union. There was an attempt to establish a prisoner union in uh, Freiburg, where I stayed too. Um, there were a few people outside, some activists from um, the FAU, uh, Free Association Union, it was an anarcho-syndicalist uh, labor union, and there were some students, most of them uh, were law students, which tried to support these little prisoners' union, but a few years later, most of the supporters outside left the group. There were no, no other members who came into the group, and as I know, years ago, this uh, supporter group uh, was on the ground. That's what I think is really difficult in German prisons. We have only around about 60,000 inmates in the whole country. And I think that is uh, m much less than you have, sometime, uh, you have in, in the whole United States, uh, the total population of inmates. You have a lot of uh, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the inmates in Germany are short time inmates. They are inside for half a year, maybe a year, maximum two years. And they have their own and their special problems. And because of the living conditions in our German prisons, which aren't not really nice, but it, they aren't really brutal. I, that's what I think. There is no motivation for the inmates to get associated really strongly and 
to fight back. It's much more an individual decision if some inmates want to fight back. That's one point. And the other point is uh, there are a lot of snitches. That's also a problem. And when three or four inmates try to organize something, they can be sure that one of them will go to the warden or to the screw or to, uh, to the staff and uh, yeah talk about and yeah and then all the inmates uh, get uh, isolated and maybe transferred to other prisons it's really difficult from time to time inmates try to bring uh, published articles or yeah try to inform the people outside of the in uh, prisons about the situation especially berlin is uh, it's the capital city of germany it's really well known in germany for the cell phones uh, cell phones regularly are prohibited in the prisons but uh, in um, a lot of prisons uh, inmates uh, getting access to cell phones eagerly and from berlin there are some videos known in which inmates try to documentize their living conditions but it's only i think it's only a base basic level of uh, prisoner union it's really difficult to establish a strong movement and i don't see at the moment that there are many inmates who are willing to organize uh, such a organi uh, such a such a union yeah that makes sense um I can also see sometimes the bad conditions are enough to keep people controlled by the guards and the administrations in the U.S. prisons for short-term gains just to be able to, to make it through a day. But what you say makes a lot of sense. Can I uh, add um, uh, some sentences? Yes. I think we agree that uh, the conditions in Germany prisons are better than in the United States and uh, the conditions in the United States sometimes better than maybe in Russia or in a lot of uh, prisons in South America or China or North Korea. If we uh, look back into history and have a look in the Nazi camps and the concentration camps of the Nazis from 1932 until 1945, uh, the German Nazis murdered millions of people. And there were some riots in German concentration camps, but not too many. And what I want to point out is in the situation in the 30s and 40s in German uh, concentration camps, the people were fighting, the inmates were fighting for to survive. They were facing death. There were no possibility, no opportunity to get released. And yeah. everybody has known these. And I was wondering that, I, I, so another point, I, I wasn't wondering that inmates actually today aren't willing to get organized and fight back. Because if I compare it with the situation in the 30s and 40s in Germany, people were facing death and weren't struggling too much. There were hundreds, maybe thousands, heroes who organized uh, riots in uh, concentration camps. But it's there were there were less people if you compare it with the millions of millions of people who were murdered. And I was thinking about what kind of human attitude must be existing that, yeah, the, that they accept uh, harsh and brutal living conditions, that they accept the, that they will be murdered in a few days or in a few weeks or in a few months. I never find a conclusion, but uh, that makes me not really wondering that the people today aren't willing to or getting organized and fight back. I find it interesting just uh, briefly that people in Berlin prisons are able to get a hold of cell phones. I know in the United States, the way that it works out is in the areas generally where there's poor labor conditions for the guards, there's a lot of corruption that allows for um, easier transit of cell phones or other illegal devices or drugs or what have you into the prisons for internal, like the internal market within the prison that becomes a much harder device to get a hold of in, for instance, some of the, the northern and midwestern and west coast states where there might be more labor protection for the guards and so they're getting paid better and so they're less likely to take bribes. Do you have any sort of like idea about why it is that phones are able to get in just because it's a big city or yeah, what that dynamic looks like? Yeah, let's talk about Berlin. I think Berlin is uh, the... Mm, 
biggest city in Germany. I don't know really the situation there and uh, the ways uh, smartphones came in, but uh, I think in prisons in Berlin, you have a uh, little bit more co uh, corruption than in uh, the prisons in like here in, in, in Baden-Württemberg or in Bavaria or Hamburg uh, because of the different society which is existing there. Here, if I can speak about Freiburg, here you have a lot of former soldiers which became guards after their career by the army. And they are living in little villages around uh, Freiburg. They are yeah. normal citizens normal uh yeah normal 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 people they yeah, they have conservative conservative attitudes and they don't they don't want to risk their job in the past i was talking about problem of corruptions with some officers and they said that they won't never risk their job for the few euros or the four dollars or whatever they can earn to smuggle a smartphone or smuggled rocks inside a prison, comparing it comparing it with the income they get from the state. Here in Germany, uh, the staff, the school has to get, get a, regu a regular education of three years. And I think that's much more than uh, the school or the, 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 the staff in the uh, United States get an education. And in the beginning of the education, if they want to get becoming a guard, they earn around one thousand a dollar each month uh, only for the only for beginning their education and so the economic situation of the stuff in germany isn't too bad it is not such bad as in the united states and if you are living in uh yeah in the area like freiburg or also it's it's a province it's easier for them to exist with these little income than if you're living in a, a big city like in Berlin. In Berlin, you have to pay, I don't know, $800, $900 uh, each month only uh, to get a little flat. Uh, for for 800 euros here in uh, Freiburg, you can get uh, maybe two or three uh, rooms and a bath and a toilet. And I think from a point of view from the state, it's a kind of protection if they pay their guards enough money and the second one is oh well and and you said that there's a different culture in berlin and that makes sense if somebody is a is working as a guard in a small facility in a small conservative community where maybe there aren't a lot of jobs and it's culturally more conservative people in a larger city might be willing to get away with more and also there's more just money flowing around too i'm sure um such as Perfect. in berlin yeah so one thing that I find quite interesting about your resistance behind bars was your continued engagement with the movement on the outside through your writing, but particularly and also uh, your engagement with comrades doing radio at RDL or uh, Radio Dreckland. Is that right? Radio Dreckland. Could you talk about how you got involved with the radio, what your engagement with that project looked like while you were inside and how it's transitioning now that you've been released? As you said, I was writing articles since uh, more than two decades. All these articles were censored by the prison because uh, incoming and outcoming mail in German prisons regularly is getting censored by, uh, sometimes by the guards. When I was in isolation, um, a deputy warden censored it. So I only published articles under state of, under control of state. And when I was transferred to Freiburg in 2013. I sent my articles to the local radio station RDL, and there is there is a radio show called Knastfunk. It's called Prison Radio, and every Sunday from 9 p.m. until 10 p.m. since 35 years. And wow, a few days a few days ago we have a little party on a little pub uh, near of RDL and celebrating these 35 years of this prison radio show. And two years or three years ago, there were a new little group inside of RDL which want to establish a new radio show called Ausbruch, Breaking Through or Breaking Out, or Breakout or Breakthrough. 
because after 35 years for the old uh, prison radio show members, there are still two or three, some, I think so, uh, I think maybe four uh, members who are organizing these shows since 35 years. And I think it's really, really a long time. They want to step back a little bit. And so they share their the, the, the time on the radio station with these new groups, which uh, consists of people which are much younger than the old group. And they try to get in contact with me. And so I sent my articles to them for a few years. And then they said I should try to get uh, permission to call them directly in the studio, in the radio station. And I tried. And the prison administration uh, has forbids these uh, kind of contact because in germany uh, you have yeah you have to write to you you, you use the phone and call uh, people outside but the prison administration controls which numbers you want to call uh, to, to 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 call and so i went to i filled this lawsuit and went to court and i went the case and after uh, i won the case uh, the prisoners prison administrations has to allowed allowed me to to call the rdl and since this time, once uh, uh, every month, I was part of the radio show on 9 p.m. I called them. I have to call them at 9 p.m. because later the rules uh, don't uh, allow phone calls. So I, uh, you know, uh, in the evening, uh, sorry, but in the evening, they turn off the, the, the telephone. So that's the reason why I call them exactly at nine o'clock in the evening. I was reporting about the situation which uh, which was happened in the last four weeks in the prison. Are there any news? And then I spoke about one topic in each radio show every month. Some, uh, for example, I was talking about the law, the, the, the prison law for visitors, which are the reasons the prison administration can forbid uh, visit visits. Uh, other point was uh, the medical situation in uh, the prisons. Are there any law? Are there any judgments which could help inmates uh, to, to struggle on a legal kind of way? And so in each radio show, I were talking about, that's what I want to say. In each radio show, I talk about the latest news uh, from prison. Uh, the last three years, uh, Corona pandemic situation dominates every radio, every prison radio show because the living conditions weren't uh, yeah uh, get, w were really bad uh, for a lot of uh, years now and yeah and the people from these uh, breakthrough radio show offers me the possibility to begin as an employee for when I get a chance to came out of the prison the radio you know RDL uh, testified because uh, the prison administration and the court wants to get a sheet of paper, testify that I can start a so-called Bundesfreiwilligendienst. That's a kind of uh, social engagement for one, in my case, for two years. The state uh, will pay the social welfare in this period. They also pay for the social insurance. And I get from the states around $500. And they will pay the rent for my flat. But a little flat, I have to say, and I get a little money, uh, extra money from the RDL. Every person get these 100 or 150 euros. And so, if you stay in the prison, if you have to, if, if somebody stayed in the prison for maybe two, uh, 27 years, uh, 600 euro each month is really a huge of money. So, that helps me a lot to exist, to survive, to organize a new life outside. And I think it's really important that someone who stayed in prison for such a long time don't throw away these experience. I can understand everyone who said after such a long time, I don't want to have to do anything with the prisons, but this wouldn't be a kind of political attitude. I think if I struggled for more than two decades against the prison system, there is uh, a moral duty, I think. Yeah, it's a moral duty uh, to share these experience with other people and much more important to help these thousands hundred thousands and millions of people who are still keeping in prison that maybe 
some of them get a chance that their situation get be known by the public. And so it's, on, it's not only a moral a duty, I think. In my case, it came from the deepest of my heart that I want to be part of the Polish prison movement, about, uh, of the anti-prison movement, because I'm sure that prisons can't be, wouldn't be any solution for, for anything. And so I have the experience of 27 years. I know a little bit about the lawsuit, I know about the legal situation, I know something about the illegal situation. And that's the reason why I'm so happy that uh, RDL offered me this chance to be part of the radio station. Yeah, that's that's great. And that um, I'm so glad that you're able to continue doing the work, but from the outside so that you can help other folks um, transition into that same thing and, and resist. You mentioned in your recent post how the wind rustles and the acorns fell a few days from freedom, which is available at your blog, freedomforthomas.wordpress.com, as well as on Brighton ABC's website. That's uh, about some of the things that you had to get used to and the help that you've had from comrades. I wonder if you would share a little bit about some of these uh, shifts in cultural norms between when you went in and um, when you've come out, technological changes, and maybe some helpful things that your friends have done to help you to settle in um, so that this might be a, a good example for other people helping loved ones into like a, a post-carceral situation? That's really a good question. And I think uh, that's also a reason I want to be part of the movement because I was getting 27 years, such a huge of uh, solidarity. And I think it's important to give something back, not like in a capitalistic uh, meaning, getting uh, yeah, um, pay back uh, your debt. But I think if the these lot of people supports inmates, it's important that the inmates, if they setting free, getting free, give something back. That's what the that, what, what point out in the beginning. Yes, the friends and comrades here in Freiburg and in other different in other cities in uh, Germany, they really really helped a lot. I was living in a in a, in a little world. Uh, prisons are uh, uh, their own world in a little world, uh, uh, which are using technologies of the 20s, not only uh, sometimes in the, of the 19th century. I needed a, a cell phone and a laptop, and they or, they organized it. They uh, look that they are secure on a high level, so that I can start in the first minute of my release uh, getting connected with the world. And it's what's really important for me, because I was interested in technology before I came to prison. Uh, some, some, maybe some uh, people know Commodore 64. It was a computer from mm -hmm. the early 80s. And I, uh, I, I know about a little bit of BASIC and later about Pascal. And I was really interested in technologies. And so now there are 27 years between. But it wasn't too difficult for me to get updated to the level of the 21st century. So the first point is it's important that people outside try it if they have the money and uh, the possibility to organize some kind of uh, these uh, modern technologies uh, and, uh, yeah, and stuff for people who are getting released. Second, it's really important that there are people who try to answer questions of the former inmates. I, when I came out uh, on 28th or uh, 29th of August this year, I have many, many questions. And because there, I wasn't in a half house before. I came directly from the high security unit uh, into uh, yeah, on, onto the streets. So it was a kind of cultural shock a little bit. And so I think it's important that for these kinds of inmates are not many, but a little group of really close friends, comrades, sometimes maybe family, in my case, not really family, but close friends and comrades who stabilize a person who is instabilized in a maximum way because 
if you have to stay in a high security unit for ages, you have your, I had a really strict uh, structure of my daily life. I were, I, I know my, my body, not, on, not, only, not only I, my body also knows if there is a door, you have to wait before this door because it doesn't make sense uh, to, to try to open this door because it's, uh, it's closed and you need a, a guard who opens this, this door. And this little uh, example should uh, visualize the difficulties. I know that uh, I can open doors by myself, but uh, the body, the automatic uh, and systematic organizations of uh, how bodies are function, how they are living, have to learn this. So I know I have to open a door by myself. And now I learned in a few minutes and a few hours that uh, it doesn't make sense to be waiting in front of the door if that there somebody will open the door for you. But I think what I heard from other former inmates who were in prisons for a long time, for example, uh, Georg, he was in prison for 57 or 58 years. And he, he told me, he has, uh, we have shared letter, letters uh, a few years ago before he died outside, that in the first few weeks, he was waiting in front of doors, that he doesn't close his letters. Because in the prison, you learn if you want to send a letter, you want to off, send off a letter, you have bring it openly to the officers and they close it for you. And he was really, he was, I think he was uh, 80 years ago, 80 years old. And, but also I want to illustrate that there are really some special kind of problems which former inmates has to struggle with. And so it's really important that there are people outside who want to be part of the way into the, uh, want to be part of the way back into a normal life. And I also know some former inmates who were released five years or 10 years ago. And they told me that they are struggling with problems after five or 10 years also, that they have dreamt, they have dreamt when they were in prison about the paradise outside of the wall. And if they get the chance to be part of the so-called paradise of the reality of the life outside of the, uh, of the walls, they, uh, they, they, they see, they feel, they make the experience, experience that it's really, really complicated, much more complicated than the daily life in prison. Daily life in prison has their own regular, uh, their own regime, their own structure, their own system, their own informal kind of law. But it's completely different from outside. For my own situation, I can point out that regularly there, I, I, I point out the differences between prisons inside and the, the living the daily life outside. But I think that's what I really, uh, what I really believe in, that if you ask someone in a friendly kind of you know, it doesn't matter if you are inside of the prison or outside of the prison. Mostly of the time, you will get an, a kindly, a friendly answer. I know outside, you can ask somebody friendly. He, maybe he or she give you, given, won't give you an answer or he insults you. This also can happen in prison. But I think if you try to be, yeah, try to be honest, tries to be f uh, friendly and yeah, and have the courage to ask somebody. Uh, that's what my experience is during the last uh, four or five weeks outside and 27 years before. Most of the people will help you. And I think that's what I want to say to former inmates or to people who get the chance to be out, uh, to get released. Yeah, ask people, ask people in a honest and friendly manner. And yes, maybe you will get in most of the situations, a honest and friendly answer. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's really great. I think, I think people that haven't been into prison forget that too sometimes. Mm. <laughs> yes, you are right. But yeah. So besides the internship with RDL, when you and I spoke earlier, you mentioned wanting to work helping migrants navigate living in Germany. And you mentioned some of the writings in your book, News from Behind the Bars, that you had helped other people with their court documents. 
can you talk about this calling um, for you or this like um, desire that you have to be involved in helping people navigate di di difficult legal situations, particularly as groups such as the like the racist AFD are gaining in power in Germany? When I was a little child, five or six, seven years old, we were living in a house with uh, Turkish immigrants. So the first Turkish word I learned was Anne, 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 Anne. Anne is the Turkish word for mom or for mother. And so I was in touch with foreigners or so-called foreigners uh, from the beginning of my life, I think. When I was 40 or 15 years old, I was part of a social network which uh, supports uh, migrant young people who go who, who go to school we uh, we were helping them by the, uh, doing their homework and learned with them mathematics german or whatever their lessons and i think it was really important for me that i was in touch with foreigners or so-called foreigners from the beginning of my life now for now for yeah more than 50 years and I think it's important to help migrants in every situation and on in every every time, all the time, because often they are much more vulnerable than the people who who aren't migrants. They are more vulnerable because regularly they have no not a lot of money. They have a diff difficult situation. The state want to deport them to their so-called home country or whatever. And if you have the possibility, you have the, the knowledge to help people, I think it's a moral duty to help these people. Not only a moral duty, it's from, from my own. It's, uh, it also came from the deepest of my heart to help people in a difficult situation. And because there are so many people in a difficult situation, there are not only migrants, they have, you have homeless people, you have women uh, which are, are victims of sexual crimes. And so, yeah, you have so many problems of the world and no one, nobody can uh, solve all these problems or whatever. So I think it's important that uh, we have to look what kind of, what kind of yeah? Um, what kind of possibility somebody has by its own? I was I I grew up with uh, law. I was interested in law since I was eleven or twelve years old. I read a lot about law books. About I know a lot about uh, the the laws, the structure of law. And in the prisons, I helped migrants to fight against uh, the state who want to deport them into other countries and so i thought by myself it would be really important not only to be part of the anti-prison movement because the anti-prison movement has a lot of to do with my own history with all my own past i need something out of this bubble and to to to, to save our environment or uh, to save the nature is also important but uh, for me i'm 52 years old it would be too difficult to learn these kind of this is too difficult to learn all these details about these other kind of stuff i know something about the migrant law and i also get uh, the chance to be part of a social center here in freiburg which uh, helps migrants every thursday from 2 p.m until 10 p.m every thursday every week 40 50 weeks uh, a year for years now and they said that they need, that they're looking for someone who is also interested to be part of them because there are so many people, so many migrants who needs this help because n most of them can't pay for a regular lawyer. Regular lawyer are really expensive in the United States, like in Germany. So I think it's the best way to get a possibility to be part of a movement outside of the anti-prison bubble and anti-prison movement is to help foreigners because i i i, I like i like foreigners and i like i like people uh, and yeah and i have the possibility and i have the attitude and i have you know, the the skills to help them 
And that's the reason why I want to be part of these kind of movement here in Freiburg too. Works. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, you, you you mentioned the IFD, uh, the, the right wing. They are like uh, yeah, like Donald Trump, or they are like the Republicans Republicans in in, in the United States. Um, sometimes the AFD are much more uh, stronger. They are more much more than li like the neo Nazis. And I think it's always important to help migrants. But in a situation like this, in an area like this, in a in a, in a time when parties like Republicans or AFD in Germany uh, rising up and tries to mistreat foreigners, try to cut their human rights. The, it's, I think it's a human duty to help uh, migrants. Yeah, thank you for adding that. Will you continue publishing on your blog um, or are there other mes methods that listeners can contact you or keep up with your thoughts and your experiences? Yes, I try to uh, publish articles on my own blog you mentioned before. I want, I think, I, I think, yeah, I, I, I love to be, I love, I love it to write articles. I love it to write letters. I all, uh, I'm always uh, writing letters, especially to people who haven't access to the internet outside. There are some older or elder people who haven't access to the internet, so I write them letters. And there are some inmates I know, some of them I know since 10, 15 or 20 years. I'm also in touch with them and write letters to them. And because I'm loving, I'm still loving uh, to write, I'm sure that as long I, I breath and my heart is beating, I will write and publish because it's so important uh, to inform people outside so, so sorry, I, I know I am also outside. Uh, I know that there is a, a sea of information outside, not only a lake, not only, uh, yeah, it's, it's a sea of information. And it's difficult to know that I'm only less than a little drop in this sea. But if there are no drops, you won't have a sea at the end. So I know that uh, there are not many people who are really interested in the situation of inmates because too many people think that it's their own, de it's their own, uh, yeah, it's their own guilty fault. fault. It's their own fault that they are thanks that their own own fault that they are keeping in prison now. And uh, yeah, here in Germany, we, sometimes we have the discussion, especially from AfD or from the Conservative Party, the CDU that uh, living conditions in the German prisons are much, much too good for them, that they must be worse, that it must be because uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel like a punishment. But I can, it is, I'm sure, and every inmate could testify that every second, every minute in the prison, every day, every, every week, every year, feels like a really hard punishment. And so I think it's important uh, to try my best to inform the people about the situation behind the bars. So in conversation, you've used the term abolitionism. And my understanding of that term comes from the context of the continuation of the movement against chattel slavery and the legacy of white supremacy and anti-black settler colonialism within the United States of America. Um, though obviously there's a lot more uh, to it than all those elements and people that are continuing to work around abolitionist movements make it as they go. It changes depending on who's participating. When you or other people in Germany talk about abolitionism, what values and critiques lie at the core of that idea for you? It's difficult, I think, that... Uh... Inmate or, uh, yeah, no, no, it's not really difficult. Uh, everyone can say uh, what he or she wants to say. But often people say if somebody is keeping in prison and says it's necessary to abolish prisons, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a difficult. But I'm really happy that there are so many people outside here in Germany, and not only in Germany, also in Europe, and some people are also, like you mentioned, in the United States or in other different countries of the world, who are struggling 
against the existence of prisons. Prisons can't be a solution for for, en for any problems. Most of the inmates are inside because of kind of uh, social problems which they can't solve with strategies which doesn't hurt other people. I know, but because, no, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure that it's difficult to abolish prisons inside the society, inside, inside of a capitalist society, because I'm, I really believe that any capitalist society, other people said socialist societies too, needs the existence of prisons for a different kind of manner or for a different kind of reasons. But I think it doesn't matter. This doesn't matter for the abolish movement because we have to think about a period of 50 years, of 100 years, maybe of more than 100 years, 20, 250 years or whatever. You mentioned the um, abolish uh, slavery movement and it needs a huge of years to abolish slavery in an in unofficial manner their slavery are still existing or in the united states and all a lot of other countries too so i think i want to be for my own i want to be part of this movement i want to be also a drop or a little glimming fire uh, of this movement and i know that there are not only inmates who are struggling for abolish prisons there are also a lot of really well yeah i don't want to say that uh, inmates aren't well educated by but i want to say that they they are also well educated people outside uh in 2019 there was uh published a kind of manifest a manifest for abolish uh, prisons and other kinds of institutions institutions and maybe uh, 20 or 30 uh, professors uh, sign these uh, manifest this declaration uh, lawyers uh, signed it uh, social workers signed it also some inmates also some philosophers also some people uh, some some psychologists i think there is a kind of academic discussion about uh, abolish abolish uh, prison uh, movement and these people are part of the movement these are the the, the national kind of uh, movement i know that there are some people struggling in an international manner some people are part of the united nations there are uh, these uh, fraction came from uh, especially from the from the churches who are struggling in the beginning of against the uh, death penalty. Later, they started a campaign against uh, life sentence, and now they are struggling for abolish prisons. So the steps are, there aren't big steps. There are only little steps. There are only, yeah, a drop by drop, little step by little step. Uh, yes, I think, like I mentioned before, prisons, the, the, the existing of prisons the reasons why prisons are existing is uh, really a complex situ I think really complex to explain. I think we have economic reasons because uh, in um, some areas in Germany, the prisons are the biggest companies in this area. So many people are working there. I have uh, read about situation in, in the United States and I've learned that there are also uh, some villages which are only existing because uh, there is um, prison in the near and hundreds of uh, of the um, people there are working with in May in, in the prison. So we have this economic is is an economic factor, and there's also a kind of psychological uh, factor. I think because it's important for the state. It's important for every institution who has power so-called power uh, to have a place in which they can send people who don't accept the yeah the, the, the living conditions in a society and there are a lot of people who want 
a place, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of psychological one too, a psychological reason too, that people want to get place where the so-called evil, the so-called evil, evil can be can be placed and can be sent, and they don't understand. These people don't understand that it's not possible to to cut off the so-called evil from from yeah from 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 the mind from the body from the attitude uh it's too easy it's too easy to think that if we send hundreds or thousands or maybe millions like in america i thought more than two million people are inside of the prison it's too difficult to think that if we send all these million people into the prison that it will be changed uh, safetyness of a society it doesn't change the safetyness in uh, for, yeah not, not really yeah i think another argument that people make too and maybe this is because of the us context is that uh that of surplus populations um and the idea that systematically like at least in our society there are portions of of the country that power is not interested in integrating or that it can't integrate and so um you know higher populations of of racial minorities um or certain classes of people tend to have interactions with law enforcement in courts and are more likely to to end up behind bars because capital hasn't deemed these populations as being necessary for its functioning at this point or um, because of racial ideology that's inherent in the United States. I don't know if that's a, a factor too in Germany, if there's like higher proportion of uh, Roma people in prisons, for instance, or like Turkish people in a way that reflects the sort of politics and values of groups like the conservative or the AFD. So it was a question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that, well, I guess it doesn't need to be a question <laughs> can i can i point out a second uh, can i uh, yes, uh, add a second i think when i discuss when i try to discuss these um uh, topic with people who aren't involved in left-wing politics or aren't interested in uh, uh, in a kind of uh, abolish prison movement i often hear that they think that we are fighting for a society in which every man can do what he or she wants, that he or she can rape or kill people or whatever. These are uh, the typical arguments against uh, the abolishing uh, the abolish movement. I think that's totally wrong and makes me a little bit mad. I do not fight and I do... Uh, cooperate with a movement who wants that people can hurt each other. That's the reason why I think to abolish prisons in a capitalism system wouldn't work because this capitalism system needs to exist places like these. But we are working for a society without prisons and in, this, in the same way we are fighting for a society in which people learn not to hurt other people. So I don't want that someone who raped child uh, is getting freed, uh, set free and uh, can start uh, yeah, a new series of uh, crimes. And this was, it is really difficult, difficult point because it really makes me mad to discuss these problem with people who also uh, who always answered with these kind of uh pre-justice oh yeah yeah no that definitely makes sense and i think that for me the the discussions around abolitionism that take you know personal and community safety into mind and realize that just putting someone in a cage doesn't resolve the issues that the issues are recreated by the society and that the abolition of prisons and police and borders requires other methods of keeping people from harm or resolving harms when they occur addressing them 
Um, I think those are the the really interesting conversations around abolitionism for me. Uh, how do we how do we stop those harms? You know, what is causing people to you know steal from each other or to harm each other, and how can we uh, help resolve those issues in a way that doesn't require guns and bars? Yeah, I don't know. And I think. And a, a report uh, in a really important issue would be uh, restorative justice. I think that's really important, uh, which uh, helps people to solve problems in their community without sending them into prisons. Restorative justice, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for having this conversation. Was there anything that I didn't ask about that you wanted to to touch on while we're on the this phone call i want to close um, our interview and i want to really thank you for your interest in the situation of the inmates here in germany and especially of the situation of my own and i also want to thank all the people who supports me for more than yeah, 25 years for more than two de decades and i want to i want to say that it's so important to spread around the word about the situation of inmates and maybe to be getting involved in a movement which maybe in the, not in the beginning to abolish prisons. Maybe sometimes people will start writing a letter to prison to be to getting in touch with a concrete person and getting a feeling for their living conditions uh, it's a kind of uh, so-called resonance phenomenon it's a kind of it has, has it has to do with empathy and compassion with the situations of inmates and it doesn't mean that uh, we have to defend what they have done in the past but that we have to find a kind of yeah a kind of feeling for their concrete situation i think if we want to we get a feeling it's easier to be touch in to be in touch with these uh, people, and maybe finally some of uh, the people will end in the not only end but also then will begin uh, to be part of an abolishing movement. And so I want to close this interview with my, I hope a lot of people will hear your show. Yeah, I hope so too. And and thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation and work with me and also for speaking in a second language. Your English is quite good. Yeah, you're a really diplomatic person. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. It's better than my German. So um yeah, well thank you and I hope you have a good rest of your day. I wish you too and maybe we are uh, getting in touch in the future again. I hope so. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Uh, well, it's November. Decorations will soon be going up. A big turkey meal is just around the corner, followed by Black Friday and the stress of consumer shopping. You know what season it is. Flash robbery season. Time to get prepared to go steal all the new stuff you're going to need for the next year. The shelves are stocked, warehouses are full, stores are crowded, weather's bad, streets are congested with traffic. The perfect storm to smash and grab along with a dozen of your closest friends. But you want to be smart about it. Head to the places you're thinking about hitting and check them out. If you're looking for security cameras, exits, the locations where they display the stuff you want to grab. You have to be able to play it through your mind, how it will go, the time it will take to grab the loot, get to the front doors, and get gone. Might as well scope out a variety of locations, clothing stores, supermarkets, jewelry stores, Walmarts, sporting goods, maybe even a bank or two. Not necessarily all in the same area, of course. You want your targets spread out across several police jurisdictions. Get with co-conspirators in practice, maybe putting together a mock-up in the basement, brainstorming ideas and possible scenarios. You want to be prepared, be able to think on your feet, adopting in real time if circumstances go south. 
When you step into these stores to commit an opportunist micro-attack on the capitalist dystopia, you want to have your shit together. I've given this a lot of thought. Hear me out. You want your whole crew to dress up as Santa Clauses. Everybody. Think about it. You can go strolling into any store. Your face is concealed by the beards and the glasses. The red hats pulled down over your heads. Your body shapes are even concealed under those big suits. When police show up later to ask store clerks what the perps looked like, they're going to get descriptions of red velvet suits and black buckles with belts, beards and hats and jolly laughs from big bellies. Police will be on the lookout for Santa Clauses during a season that Santa Claus stands on every single street corner, sits in the middle of every mall, perhaps even occupies stools at the local bars. See the brilliance of this? But wait, there's more. As Santa, you can stroll into any store with your bag already slung over your shoulder. That's not just the bag you're going to fill with loot. Oh, no. You don't come in with an empty bag. You come in with a bag full of useful stuff. Super soakers full of ketchup. Balloons filled with paint. Maybe some wiffle ball bats. You know, some glass jars full of marbles. The flash robbery to beat all flash robberies. So first, a couple of advanced scouts can go in, stroll down the aisles, looking for security or off-duty cops. When they're convinced everything is good, they give the signal, and the rest of the Santas come filtering in, a few at a time, taking up their prearranged positions. Your watches are all synchronized, of course, so when the alarms beep, everyone leaps into action. The security and diversion detail dumps their bags and tosses the bags to the loot snatchers. While the loot snatchers spend 60 seconds filling their bags, the security and diversion detail flings balloons around, splattering paint everywhere, blasting store staff with super soakers, slinging whipple ball bats to keep good Samaritans at bay. Then, at the end of 60 seconds, everyone dashes for the exits, with the security diversion detail last, smashing the jars of marbles onto the floor on their way out, making it impossible for anyone to give chase. Once out of the store, walk. Don't run. Split up. Move out in different directions. Just your average Santa with a bag over the shoulder, strolling through town on his way to somewhere. You don't want to get into a vehicle, just in case there are security cameras. Also, this is important, don't carry identification or a cell phone. Leave all that at home. Just in case you're caught, you want to be unidentifiable. You can even put super glue on your fingerprints and let it dry. That way, if you do get captured, simply insist that you really are Santa Claus, that you came from the North Pole, and that you have diplomatic immunity in the United States. Insist on speaking with your consulate, a right you have guaranteed to you under international law, and remind police that if you're not released, their kids will get nothing for Christmas. But I doubt you have to worry about all of that. Nobody is going to gang-tackle Santa at Walmart during the holiday season and let the cops drag him away. If anyone objects during the robbery, just stay in character. Tell them that you're desperate and have no other way to fill stockings this year because the elves went on strike. That's right. Blame the elves union. If you follow this flash robbery game plan, this could be the happiest holiday you've ever had. You can have all of your needs met for you and 50 of your closest loved ones, and then liquidate the remainder on eBay for spending cash. It's the season for giving. It's not your fault the greedy fucks are still trying to sell it. We have to break them of that. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're going online to order a Santa suit, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 
You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org or the Final Straw Radio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.